And our guest speaker tonight has a parallel history with uh, our founding pastor, Dr. Old Johnson. You'll recall that uh, Pastor Johnson got saved as he was first entering the army way back in the Korean conflict. And that's the same way that our guest speaker tonight, Dr. Michael Haggard, got saved. He went from high school into the army, and the very first year that he was out there, he was reached uh, with the gospel of Christ and, and came to a knowledge of him. And then after he served at a complete 23 years in the army, he sensed God's call to go into full-time ministry, and he trained for that and went all the way through uh, seminary. And then the seminary, Mid-American Baptist, the same one that uh, Pastor Harmon went to, uh, called him to work full-time with them. And, and, and in addition to that, he also works uh, as an administrator in a Christian school down in Tennessee. So, Dr. Haggard, looking forward to it, sir. Thank you. You know, it's, uh, it's amazing how God works things out. Can you hear me? Am I on? Good. Uh, that story that he just said that I, I grew up in an unchurched home in California and knew nothing of the gospel, nothing of the Bible. I didn't know the Old Testament from the New Testament, Jesus from Jesus. I knew nothing at all. Uh, but there was a Gideon out there passing out New Testaments. The day I entered active duty, August 5th, 1975. And so I took a new Bible, I took a New Testament from him, began to read it, and came to know Christ uh, about four months later. So I always wonder, you know, God's timing is always perfect, but I always wonder, what did that Gideon want standing there that day? Would I be standing here? Probably not. Uh, so it just made how God's timing works things out. And now that I'm standing here and your pastor is somewhere else, <laughs> I learned a couple of weeks ago that my, the timing of my visit timed perfectly with the birth of a grandchild. So I was traveling my way here, and I was texting Dr. Harmon. I said, so you a grandpa yet? Man, that dude sent me a picture within about two minutes of that grandbaby. <laughs> so he is a proud grandfather, no doubt, spoiling that little baby the best he can. And having nine grandchildren myself, I don't blame him at all. Uh, turning your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17, we're going to examine verses 14 to 21. And I want to preach today on the littleness of faith. The littleness of faith. It's a simple message on faith. What is faith? Faith is merely believing, but it's more, isn't it? Faith is believing in the unseen. The unseen is the essence and the substance of faith the scriptures teach us. But it's more, faith is believing in the unseen God and knowing that God is a spirit. He's here with us tonight and he is everywhere, but it's more. Faith is believing in the Son of God, Jesus. Perhaps faith is something new to you. If that's, if that's, if that's true, that's okay, because there was a time in my life when faith was new to me, very new. Perhaps uh, you had a life of faith earlier, but life happened and you drifted some. That's okay, too. Perhaps you have a life of faith and you want it to grow and to flourish. It's messages for all of the above. Now, there's some parallel passages to my text. Mark 9, 14 to 29 is the longest. We'll refer to that as I get into the text of the message in Luke 9, 37 through 43. So let me ask a question. How's your faith? How is your faith in 2021? You know, I ever think that a year, a life can happen to you, you to put COVID on top of that. So how, how'd your, how would you, how'd your faith do in 2021? And now we're 75 days into 2022. So would you say that your faith is on a trajectory to flourish in 2022? I want to encourage you to invest time in growing your faith this year. I just, want to, I just want to say this up front. It doesn't happen by accident. Growing your faith doesn't happen by accident. It's a deliberate response to a life lived and disciplined to the things of God. It just doesn't happen by accident. And at times, all this, our faith has been tested and found weak, hasn't it? I can give testimony to that, that you think you're cruising along, man, you're on the top of the world, and you get tested, and you find out that your faith is not up to the tax, up to the, up to the test. 
Even the disciples whom Jesus trained had periods of weak faith. And we're going to look at one of those today. But Jesus taught them two disciplines to prevent weak faith. I'm going to talk about those a little bit today too as well. Let me set the context first for this text here. Jesus has just taken Peter, James, and John up to a high place in a mountain so they could experience the transfiguration. Now, I cannot think of one, I guess the resurrection probably the greatest event, but this is one event that probably would be the pinnacle if you were a disciple, one of when Peter, James, and John watching this thing called the transfiguration take place. Jesus' face shone like the sun. Jesus' clothes were as white as light. Moses and Elijah appeared and talked with Jesus. God spoke to the group, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard the voice of God, they fell to their knees terrified. Jesus had to go to each one and to touch them and tell them to get up and to not be afraid. Think about the times when Jesus told the disciples to not be afraid. As the four came down from the mountain, they weighed into humanity. They, waited, they, 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 get, they, they link up with their nine other disciples. They wait into a crowd. There's some scribes there as well. But there's a father there with a very, very sick son. So let's take that and spring into the text here in verse 14. When they, Jesus, Peter, James, and John, came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him and saying, so you get introduced to the people that are going to take place they're going to participate in this drama. You see the crowd. You know, Jesus, Jesus, Peter, James, and John are there. There's a father with a very, very sick son. You have to go to the parallel passage in Luke. He tells us that this event occurred after the day of transfiguration. Mark tells us that the scribes were also there, questioning the disciples, and Jesus confronts the scribes regarding their questioning. But at this juncture, we find out what the questions were all about. This father comes and he falls down at Jesus' feet. Lord, the father says, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and is very ill. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. He had a serious problem. And it says here that he refers to his son as a lunatic. Now that Greek word that's used there actually means moonstruck. There was a feeling in the ancient world that during particular moon phases that it would bring on bouts of mental illness. So this father thought that his son was having to deal with something that dealt with something that was controlled by the phases of the moon. And you can see here that he has some serious issues. He often falls into the fire and often into the water. Now, all the gospel writers are going to conclude the reason why that he has these symptoms, and it's because of demon possession. But he says here, have mercy on my son. Now, the father is using very emotional, assertive language with Christ. He's speaking in the the imperative mood here. So he's not mincing words. He's not asking for suggestions. He is being very forceful and very emotional with Christ. Lord, have mercy on my son. Have mercy on my son. For he's a lunatic and very ill. He often falls into the fire and often into the water. Luke tells us that this boy was his father's only son. That was a big deal in the biblical times, to have your only son your only child. We also begin to learn that this boy would also foam at the mouth and grind his teeth from both Mark and Luke. So this wasn't his only symptoms here. And again, all the biblical writers talk about the only reason, the reason for this child's symptoms are demon possession. But isn't it just like Satan to put a child on a pathway of self-destruction to try to destroy the object of God's love, humankind, and that's what God does in all of our lives when Satan gets a foothold, is he tries to get us on a pathway of self-destruction. And we see that around us every day. Verse 16. I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. They could not cure him. This is a sobering indictment, isn't it? The disciples who were given authority by Christ himself over demons, could not cast the demon out and cure the child. So let me ask this. Have you ever been tested and your faith found lacking? Have you ever been tested and your faith wasn't up to the task? 
Have your hands ever taken hold of a task you felt God had called you to and then failed at that task? Have you ever faced a spiritual challenge in your personal life and tried to overcome it but failed? Have you ever had a mountaintop experience, a big, great spiritual success, only to be tested a short time later and found lacking? Because they just, three of these disciples had just left the, the, the transfiguration and saw Jesus in a glorified body. That would put me on the top of a mountain. But here they come down and face this father with this child, and their faith isn't up to the task. But verse 17, Jesus vents on them. And Jesus answered this in you, unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. So Jesus is not happy at all. And he's venting some frustration at someone. Now, there's several, there's several, there's several groups here. There's the scribes. There's a crowd. There's a father, a child that needs help. The disciples. Who exactly is Jesus angry with? And you know, the funny thing about these biblical writers is that there's, variant, there's, there's, there's nuances to, to how they tell this story in Mark and Luke and in Matthew. But all the biblical writers got this word for word, this rebuke, so to speak. All of them got this word, word for word. You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. In my mind, Jesus could expect no help from the scribes, no help from the crowd, no help from the Father. I think he had every expectation that the disciples would have cured this boy. But again, they did not. So if you, if you ask this preacher, this rebuke is for the disciples. And he's venting and showing some very, very human frustration with the disciples. And then he gets assertive with the Father and says, you bring that child to me. And Jesus rebuked him, and the demon came out of the him, and the boy was cured at once. Now, I want to leave here for a moment and go to Mark 9, because I want to get into the dialogue that Jesus had with his father, and it's described here in Mark 9, starting in verse 20. So they brought the boy to him, to Christ. When he, the boy, saw Christ, immediately the spirit threw him into convulsions. And falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It is often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And look at Jesus' reply. Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. All things are possible to him who believes. How many times in your prayer life have you been dealing with a specific burden that's very heavy, and you pray day after day after day, days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months, and you pray things like this. Lord, if you just do this, if you just make this happen, I know, God, you can do this. But like this father, will you do it? Will you do it? And the father says here, immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. So this statement his father makes displays both strength and weakness, doesn't it? It's both sacred but very, very human. It displays, it displays both faith and faithlessness. It's both a statement of faith and a confession. Is this not where all of us live? Have you not been there in your prayer life? If you haven't been there yet, you will be. Just live long enough. There will be burdens that come into your heart and your life that you pray, you try to escape, you try to evade, you try to get out of their way. You can't. It's a storm that God wants you to go through. And you pray for relief. You pray for an answer. And it takes time, weeks, months, oftentimes years. I was the first one of my family that became a Christian. My burden was to lead my parents to Christ, the rest of my family. I realized that my parents were going to be a little difficult. And so I ended up praying for them. I prayed for them for 20 years before they finally came to faith in Christ. 
So was that easy 20 years? Did I ever get weary in well-doing? Oh, yeah. Did I ever stop praying? Oh, yeah. But I'm telling you that this verse, these verses and what this, what this man is going through with this child speaks to all of us, all of us. And all of us who have been there, if you haven't been there, you will be at some point in your life where you will say, Lord, I know you can, but will you? And, I, I, and you, the, the best thing about this father's prayer is it contained enough faith to get the job done. It, had, it contained more faith than the disciples had. And therein lay the dichotomy, human limitation versus God's ability. So Jesus takes the boy, rebukes the foul spirit, and heals him completely. Now let's go back to Matthew 17. But verse 19 contains a million-dollar question. The disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why couldn't we drive it out? What was our problem? Why could we not accomplish that task? Jesus said to them, because of the littleness of your faith. For truly, I say to you, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Now, this Greek word that's used here for littleness of faith is really one word. It's a compound word, oligos pistos, little, slight, few, faith, uh, that the biblical writer uses here, and it describes the disciples' faith at this moment where they were unable to do something that Jesus had commissioned them and expected them to do. I want to consider the disciples just for a moment. Jesus called each one personally. At this point in the text, each one had been with Christ about two and a half years in ministry. They slept with him, ate with him, traveled with him. They saw him feed 5,000 at one one juncture and 4,000 at another time. They seen him calm storms on the sea, raise the dead, heal the sick, cause the blind to see, he healed lepers, and he caused the deaf to hear. He sent him out two by two to preach the gospel. He gave them authority over the demons, yet their faith wasn't up to the task. Both Matthew and Luke tell of this dialogue about mustard seed faith. If you have this faith the size of a mustard seed, one of the smallest seeds, you can move mountains and nothing will be impossible. Now, let me make some observations about that text. This is a metaphor. Jesus never moved a mountain around to make a point. We don't need Jesus to move a literal mountain today. The application of high explosive and earth-moving equipment can do an adequate job. So don't expect Jesus to move a literal mountain for you. And he says, nothing will be impossible for you. This must be interpreted in light of other scripture, human limitations, and God's will. It is not a blank check for anything like escaping every, each and every calamity in life. Jesus with God could do anything, but he could not escape the cross. But to be honest, much is not accomplished for the kingdom of God today because we just possess little faith. Why? Why is that? Why does my faith get tested and found lacking? Why does your faith get tested and not be not up to, not up to the task? Why is that? Why was the disciples' faith weak? Why is our own? Verse 21, Jesus says, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. As little as mustard seed faith is, it doesn't happen by accident. Your faith is not going to flourish by accident. It's going to flourish on purpose. The word prayer occurs both in Matthew and Mark. The word fasting only occurs in Matthew. So I'm going to deal with both of these words here as I get on into the text here and on into my sermon. Now, I want to consider the disciples once again. How many times was it recorded in Scripture that Jesus would slip away by himself and go somewhere to pray? How many times? How many times would he do that? You see, often in Scripture, Jesus would leave the crowds, leave the disciples. He would go off somewhere to pray alone by himself. And sometimes he would pray all night long. You see that time and time and time again in Scripture. Remember how he began his public ministry. He fasted and prayed for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. How did he end his public ministry? 
you find Jesus in the garden with the disciples praying. Remember that? What were the disciples doing? Sleeping. And Jesus said, could you not watch with me one hour? Could you not just pray with me one hour? This one moment in time when I really need human companionship, I'm about to go get crucified and scourged, and you guys are sleeping? Could you not watch with me one hour? How often is it recorded in the Scripture that the disciples engaged in like behavior? How often did they, either individually or collectively, slip away to a secluded place to pray? Did any of them ever ask Jesus if they could go and pray with him? Did any of them fast and pray for 40 days and 40 nights? Is there any evidence that any of them prayed all night to their father like Jesus did from time to time? Perhaps, just perhaps, they saw no need to work that hard because miraculous things were happening around them all the time. They were fed by a constant stream of spiritual nourishment, both audibly and visually. They were spiritually very comfortable. Remember what John wrote in his gospel, the last chapter? If all the things that Jesus did was recorded, the world itself, what, could not contain the books that would be written. And the disciples had a front row seat to every bit of that. If there was a need or something that wasn't getting done, Jesus would do it anyway, right? Anyway, right? The disciples followed Jesus and did what he said mostly. What else was there to do? Is it any wonder that when their faith was tested, it was found insufficient, not up to the task? And can I tell you something? Let me be transparent for a minute. As an ordained Baptist minister with two seminary degrees, that scares me to death. What the disciples saw, what they experienced, what they participated in, and then when they were tested, Jesus is six months from crucifixion. He's at the end of his public ministry. And when they were tested, they were tested. Their, their faith wasn't up to the task. You know what that tells me? I could go to church faithfully. I could listen to sermons online constantly. I could read Christian books energetically. I could listen to Christian music exclusively. I could tithe regularly. I could serve in the church enthusiastically and still end up with weak. All these things that I listed are all good things. But they are a byproduct of a good, strong faith. What's missing? What were the disciples missing? Intimate communion with their father. Intimate communion with their father. I'm going to deal with prayer and fasting here for a few moments, and then I'll, I will close. Prayer is the fertile soil through which faith grows and matures. Either we will develop an inner need for prayer, we will voluntarily go to our prayer clubs because we know we need to be there and want to be there, or the trials of life, the external things about us are going to drive us to our prayer closet. I'll say that again. Either we're going to voluntarily go to our prayer clubs because we know as humankind we need to be there to transact business with our Father and to walk and commune with Him, or we're going to be driven there by the trials and challenges of life. There's really two, only two ways you're going to look at that. The fervency of your faith, the passion of your faith, the maturity of your faith, all these things, and yes, the power of your faith, all are contingent on and connected to your prayer life. I'll say that again. The fervency of your faith, the passion of your faith, the maturity of your faith, and yes, the power of your faith, all are contingent on and connected to your prayer life and my prayer life. Good conversation grows human relationships, doesn't it? Just don't talk to your spouse for a couple of days and see what happens. Good conversation grows human relationships, and good conversation grows our relationship with our Creator and your faith. Everyone can produce mustard seed faith, but prayer is what causes mustard seed faith to grow and be effective. We're going to ask this question, then why don't we do it?
If you could count the minutes of prayer you have in a week, how long would that be? Here's why. Here, check this out. Prayer is work, isn't it? I mean, if you, if you spend a lot of time doing it, you're going to know prayer is work. It's a responsibility. It's discipline. It's necessary. It's essential. And it's not easy. It requires time, investment, and labor. And it is an exercise in faith itself because you're communicating with someone you cannot see, you cannot touch, who doesn't answer back audibly and doesn't give instant gratification. And we've been conditioned to want instant gratification. But praying for my parents to get saved for 20 years was a difficult task. It was necessary, but difficult. But then that is the essence of God. He is spirit, and he wants us to live in intimate communion with, with, with both of us because of his great love for each of us. As Jesus went alone to pray, we need to follow that example. Set a time each day when you're uninterrupted and spend time in prayer and be disciplined to that time and place daily and listen for the voice of God to speak to you through the scriptures. Make sure that your prayers Cover adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. One of the most beautiful pictures in Scripture is in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve had sinned, and God was doing the normal thing he always did. He would go down in the garden in the cool of the day and walk and, and commune, commune with them. But this day, he's walking in the garden, calling her name. Adam! Eve! Where are you? Can I tell you this? God wants to meet each and every one of us that way. He yearns for our communion. He yearns to hear our voice in prayer. He yearns to have companionship and fellowship with us and to walk with us. I just want to encourage you to maintain a vibrant prayer life. Stay disciplined to that time, disciplined to that place each and every day. Let me talk briefly about fasting. You don't hear a lot about this anymore. Uh, it was practiced in the Old Testament and practiced in the New Testament. Jesus spoke about it during the uh, Sermon on the Mount. He taught that fasting was not to be done publicly to gain the praise and notice of men, but to be done in secret to gain God's notice and favor. So what is biblical, biblical fasting? Typically, when you study fasting in scriptures, it's basically going without food. And that's a difficult sell today because you live in a country that gives you so much, and some of that stuff tastes good. And it's hard to push it away and even to consider going without food for any period of time at all. But I just want, I just want to encourage you. Uh, I've had the time I could tell you some wonderful stories and answers to prayer through my own personal uh, fasting life. Uh, I, I can't do that here at this time, but I'm telling you, there's something about maintaining a vibrant prayer life and self-denial that really gets God's attention. Now, a lot of people can't fast. Uh, and I would say that if you're my age or older, you need to go see a doctor before you even think about doing it. Uh, but it's, I would like to see this get more publicity in churches than it, than it, than it I, I tell you, as I stand here, I've been engaged in Christian work probably. I've been a believer about 45 years. I've heard sermons on fasting maybe two or three times. It's just not. We just, it's a neglected discipline of the church. Uh, I'd like to see it come back. But here's my rule of fasting. When I'm overcome with a spiritual prayer need that takes my appetite away, I feel like God's leading me to a period of fasting. Then I will take up fasting at that time. Uh, but again, I've had some wonderful, wonderful experiences in answer to prayer through it. So where are you in your pathway of faith? I'll go back to my original opening question. So are, is your faith on a trajectory to flourish in 2022? If you don't have a good answer to that question, I just want to, I just, want to just encourage you to go, to go to prayer. Set a time during the day or night that you go to your prayer closet and you spend time for, on your faith before God. I'm telling you, there's, with all the disciples experienced, and all that Christ commissioned them to do. They failed that test. And Jesus told them. 
There's mention of two of these parallel texts. I just want to encourage you to spend time in prayer. It doesn't take a whole lot to get started, just a little. Maybe you need to renew yourself to a prayer life. It doesn't take a whole lot either. Just a little bit of effort to get started again. And I'm telling you, it puts you on a trajectory and pathway of growth. God's commissioned all of us to serve. He wants us all engaged in expanding his kingdom. He wants us all engaged in kingdom work. And if we're going to make an impact, if we're going to do great things for God, the pathway to that runs through your prayer closet. It runs through my prayer closet. You can do all the other things you're supposed to do, like the disciples were doing, and have little faith, as Christ described it. Little faith. Maybe a life of faith is something new to you. Maybe, maybe you don't know Christ. You've never been born again. If that's you, I'd love to talk to you tonight. You don't need to leave this building without getting that settled. Uh, so if you don't know Christ, and that's okay. There was a time in my life I didn't know Christ. And I remember those, I remember those years. I remember them really well. I'd like to talk to you tonight. If you have any prayer needs, I'd like to, I'd like to pray with you. But I'm about to close the service. I'm going to pray and close the service. And honored to preach to you tonight. But I just pray that all of us, God wants to use all of us to make an impact for kingdom work. But again, the effectiveness of all that runs through yours and my prayer closet. Let's take that to heart. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, for your truth. I love you today, Father God. And I do pray you would take your word, Father God. And I pray, Father God, that fall on fertile ears. Father God, use your word to bring you glory, Father and I pray that some in here, Father God, would take up the discipline of prayer, would be serious about it, Father God, would go to their prayer closet, Father God, and petition you and walk with you, Father God, daily. I pray, Father God, you would use them mightily, Father God, to expand your kingdom. In Jesus' name.